So my name is Will Laws. I'm a senior solutions architect here at AWS. I primarily work with our digital natives customers. Uh, fun fact, back in 2009, I was working at my first job that used AWS. And it was two days before we launched RDS. So today I'm here to talk to you about Amazon Aurora and Amazon DynamoDB and how they provide availability and resiliency for your applications. So let's get into it. So we've got a quick agenda first. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about why resiliency matters. We're going to be talking about Amazon Aurora's concepts for availability uh, in multi-AZ and global databases. And we're also going to be talking about Amazon DynamoDB's concepts for availability also in multi-region. So uh, we'll close it off with a use case. So first, I want to talk to you a little bit about why resiliency matters at all. Right? Dr. Werner Vogel says everything fails all the time. And it's important for us to understand how our applications react to failure. So in order to do that, I want to explain a few terms before we begin. So what is resilience? Well, resilience refers to the ability of a workload, uh, a collection of resources, if you will, and code to deliver business value, uh, such as customer-facing applications or back-end processes to respond and quickly recover from failures. A workload might consist of a subset of resources in a single AWS account. It could span multiple accounts and even multiple regions. So there's three mental models I want to talk to you about. Uh, as we go through this presentation, keep these in mind, OK? So the first is high availability. How can you build a system to be highly available with resistance to common failure modes? Disaster recovery. How can you recover your system if you run into those rare failure modes? And finally, this notion of continuous improvement. How do you make changes quickly in the event of a failure so that you can recover in time? There's a lot of different strategies for this, and they're not all one size fits all. So it's important that we think about them uh, in terms of their RPO and their RTO. And these might be phrases that you've heard before, but maybe you haven't. So RPO, or your recovery point objective. An RPO is basically from the time that we have our event, our large event that has caused us a failure, how much data have we lost? We can plan for this, and we can understand this beforehand, and that's good. But we need to understand it for sure. And then the other thing I want to talk about is RTO, or the recovery time objective. This is how long it actually takes us to recover when we have one of these types of events. So if we understand our RPO and our RTO, we're able to understand how much data we're losing and how long it takes to recover. So I'll start on the left. We're going to start with backup and restore. Backup and restore typically has a higher RPO and a higher RTO. This basically means that you're losing a little bit of data, uh, and it takes you a while to recover. This is because when you restore a backup, uh, that backup happened before your event. So the amount of data you lose is happening during that time the event happened and the backup was last taken. That could be a decent amount of time. And then the RTO, that's how long it takes you to actually restore your backup, right? So this could be a larger amount of time. Uh, we have three other strategies, though. Uh, pilot light. A pilot light strategy has a significantly reduced RTO and RPO, typically measured in tens of minutes instead of hours for a backup and restore. Data is live and in another area. However, you might not have compute resources operating and providing uh, the ability to serve that data to your workload. It's a little bit more costly but it provides a significant improvement to the amount of time that your application takes to recover. Then we have warm standbys. This might be what you're traditionally used to uh, when you think of an active and a passive environment. With a warm standby, data is replicated into multiple availability zones or multiple regions, and those resources exist. However, they may, to, may need to scale up a bit for your application to begin consuming from those availability zones or this warm standby. It costs a little bit more, but your RTO and your RPO could be measured in single-digit minutes. And then we have finally have active-active. Active-active keeps the application working across both sets of the replicated workload. You're able to uh, have near zero downtime or zero downtime, and your users might not even notice that a failure has happened. It's a little bit more expensive, but for mission-critical workloads, this is an essential way for you to provide robust availability. Now, how do you do that on AWS? Well, let's talk a little bit about regions and availability zones. So AWS has 31 regions all over the world, including here in Australia, in uh, Canada, 
Israel, New Zealand, United States, all together, that's about 99 availability zones. What's an availability zone? Well, an availability zone, uh, there's at least three of them in a region. But availability zones aren't the smallest unit either. Availability zones are made up of data centers. These data centers are separated by a meaningful distance. So there's no shared fates, maybe like a flood, right? But they're also close enough together to be thought of as a logical data center. So how do you know when you should use more than one region? This is a question I get asked all the time. Well, it usually comes down to two things, business continuity planning and disaster recovery and geographically distributed customer bases. Let's say that uh, your business needs to plan for disaster recovery uh, and your tolerance is, well, if this region fails, we'd like our data to exist in a second region. That's typically what we see for business continuity and disaster recovery. But what about if our users are located in many different countries? There could be compliance regulations that require your customer data to reside in the country or in the region that they are located in. There's a side effect of this as well. Users from Australia, if their data is hosted in an Australian region, maybe Sydney, AP Southeast 2, they can access their data locally. And that improves the latency and performance of the application as well. Just like users from Germany could access their data directly from the Germany region in Frankfurt. So how do you build a modern data strategy? Well, a modern data strategy starts with migrating to the cloud and moving towards infrastructure that enables you to achieve the scale that you need at the right cost while reducing operational overhead. And this is an interesting thing to think about. What we want you to do is remove the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Things like managing your backups, managing uh, the infrastructure. How do I provision a database? How do I provision my network? On AWS, we can help you do all of those things through this group of purpose-built databases. So maybe you have a data store that, or a data access pattern that resembles a graph. That's where we have Amazon Neptune, and it can provide graph database services for you. Or maybe you're just accessing lots of JSON documents. DocumentDB is a great solution for this. But today, we're going to be covering DynamoDB and Amazon Aurora. So let's get into the thick of it with Aurora. We'll start with single region concepts using multiple availability zones, and then we're going to progress into multi-region design. So Aurora offers a purpose-built database solution for organizations to future-proof their applications. AWS database services handle management tasks like server provisioning, patching, and backups, allowing teams to focus on value-added work. Enterprises are le leveraging AWS migration system uh, programs to optimize migrations, with over 800,000 databases migrated so far. There's a lot of key features and core features to Aurora. And today, what we're going to talk about is global databases, point-in-time recovery, automated and continuous backups, and the fault-tolerant, self-healing, auto-scaling storage. So let's talk about backups a bit. Aurora's backup capabilities enable point-in-time recovery for your instance. This allows you to restore your database to any second during the retention period up to the last five minutes. Your automatic backup retention period can be configured up to 35 days. Now, automated backups are stored in Amazon Simple Storage Service, or Amazon S3, which is designed for 11 nines of durability. Amazon Aurora's backups are automatic, incremental, and continuous. They have no impact on your database performance due to the separation of the storage layer from the compute layer. And now that's the really interesting thing about Aurora, and that's what I want to show you how it works. So let's take a look at this. We're going to start at the top with the compute. You'll notice in each availability zone, there's separate compute. On an instance failure, Aurora uses Amazon RDS's multi-AZ technology to automatically fail over to one of up to 15 replicas that you've created in any of your three availability zones. If no replica exists or has been provisioned in case of a failure, we will attempt to create a new Aurora database instance for you automatically. And because of the separation between the storage and the compute, you don't have to wait on the database to hydrate. It simply attaches to the storage layer, and you're up and running. But let's talk about the storage layer. This is where I think a lot of the cool stuff happens. So with Aurora, we use a six-way quorum spread across all three availability zones. 
we have a write set of four and a read set of three. And maybe that's a little confusing, and I'm going to get into what that means. We issue writes to all six copies of data and acknowledge the write as complete once we obtain acknowledgement from four of the six nodes. Now, if a node is running slow, that's OK. That means we can use the other four nodes to obtain those writes. But what if a node doesn't respond? We can automatically add a new node to your quorum and bring it up to speed as long as the quorum exists. So you might be wondering, well, there's three availability zones. Why don't we have a three-node quorum? Why do we have a six-node quorum? That's a really good question. If you have a three-node quorum and an availability zone just goes away, like this, <laughs> uh, what happens to your data? Now, if you have a three-node quorum, that means we need to have two of our rights to be con we need three of our rights to be consistent to trust our data, uh, and we need two of our rights to be consistent to read our data. So, if three of our rights need to be consistent, this is a two-three quorum. Uh, what happens if the right was successful on availability zone one, but as availability zone two failed, the right didn't write? Availability zone three hasn't responded yet. It's the third right in the pattern. Well, now the data is not readable. Now the write isn't, writes aren't available, and we can't recover the quorum, and the database value would be lost. So this is why we use a six-node quorum. With a six-node quorum, there are still four nodes available when, it, when a AZ fails. And because in a six-node quorum, we only need three of the nodes in the quorum to be available for reads, if another node fails, we're still able to recover from the volume. We're still able to recover the volume. We're able to process reads the entire time. And writes can be restored very shortly. Now, we manage all of this for you. And this isn't something that you have to build or think about. So let's move into global databases with Aurora. Aurora is designed for a globally distributed application, allowing a single Aurora database to span multiple AWS regions. It replicates your data with no impact on database performance. It enables fast local reads with low latency in each region and provides disaster recovery for region-wide outages. If your primary region suffers a performance degradation or outage, you can promote one of the secondary regions to take read-write responsibilities. An Aurora cluster can recover in less than one minute, even in the event of complete regional outage. This provides your application with an effective recovery point objective of one second and a recovery time objective of less than a minute, providing strong foundations for you to build your application. Now, what about, uh, what, what about if we add more? Right? What if there's more than two regions? Well, global databases let you scale these uh, database, uh, let you scale your applications across the world by putting your database close to where your users are. Your applications enjoy quick data access regardless of the number and location of secondary regions, and typical cross region replication latencies are below one second. You can achieve further scalability by creating up to 16 replicas in any region and they will all stay continuously up to date. So let's talk about, that's a lot about how reads work in multi-region, but let's talk about how writes work in a multi-region design. So here we have Sydney and Tokyo regions, and we have an application running across both of them. Readers in the secondary Aurora database cluster in Tokyo are accepting uh, reads that are being replicated from the Sydney region. That's what we've explained so far. Let's add a couple more regions. These are also secondary regions. So now we have a total of three secondary region and one primary region. People in other regions want to write to this database. So with global write forwarding, what we can do is receive that write on the reader node in another region, and we can pass that write back to the region that is currently the primary. Once this happens, the writer acknowledges that it has received the write request. The primary region uh, commits this to the transaction log and then replicates all of that information to all of the secondary regions. This allows your applications to have read and write functionality in a global relational database. And that's a lot about Aurora, but let's get to DynamoDB as well. So 
at a high level, DynamoDB is designed for high availability, durability, and consistent low latency, typically in the single digit milliseconds of performance. Amazon DynamoDB runs on a fleet of AWS managed servers that leverage solid state drives to create an optimized high density storage platform. This platform decouples performance of table size and eliminates the need of the working set of data to exist in memory while still returning consistent low latency responses to queries. As a managed service, DynamoDB abstracts its underlying architecture details from the user. DynamoDB, even in a single region, has five nines of availability. Our commitment to high availability means your mission critical applications continue to run seamlessly. So the core features that we're going to be focusing on today are on-demand backups and multi-region active-active with DynamoDB global tables. On-demand backups allow you to create full backups of your DynamoDB tables for data archiving, helping you meet your corporate and government regulatory uh, requirements. You can backup tables from a few megabytes to hundreds of terabytes of data with no impact to the performance and availability of your applications. Now, on-demand backup processes backup requests in seconds. So regardless of the size of your table, you don't have to worry about back, uh, backup schedules or long running jobs. And just like Aurora, uh, with point in time recovery, you can pick specific second recovery periods uh, up to the last 35 days. Now, all backups are automatically encrypted, of course, and cataloged for easy discoverability. You can execute backups and restore operations with a single click in the AWS console or with a single API call. So let's get into multi-region now. DynamoDB Global Tables offer a multi-region, multi-active solution where you can write locally to every region. Writes are fast and then replicated to other regions. So you get strong consistency in the local region and eventual consistency in the other regions. Any conflicts are resolved using a last writer wins process. Basically, whoever said something to the database last, that's what's the truth. The idea is that the global database eventually converges on an identical consistent state. Global databases are built on AWS's global footprint to provide you with a fully managed multi-region and multi-active uh, uh, multi database that provides fast local read and write performance for massively scaled global applications. Uh, global tables replicate your DynamoDB tables automatically across your choice of AWS regions, and they eliminate the difficult work of replicating between regions yourself uh, and resolving conflicts. So you can focus your time on the business value that's most impactful for your customers. So you've probably heard of Disney Plus. Uh, they're one of the largest global online video streaming platforms. Uh, they launched in November 2019, and they're the home of Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, and National Geographic. Disney Plus chose DynamoDB to help them uh, with their multi-region expansion. So as Disney Plus moves into a new region, they're able to replicate their DynamoDB tables there. Uh, there are uh, excellent ways to also be cost effective with this. So you have the ability to switch back and forth between on-demand and provision capacity. So while customers are still uh, being added to a new region, you can pick the capacity model that's most cost effective for your application. So today we talked about having a good availability strategy and how it's not a one size fits all solution. We talked about having different strategy types that work for you. We talked about how AWS has multiple database solutions that can achieve multi-region and multi-availability zone resiliency and how easy it is to leverage these managed databases. We talked about multi-AZ Aurora and the improved fault tolerance of its storage layers. We talked about global Aurora and the ability to automatically fail over and having a multi-region design. We also talked about DynamoDB and how it's resilient in a single region and in multiple regions with local rights. So what I want to do is challenge you to think about how your applications are built. Can you leverage any of these technologies? And is there something that you're looking for out of a database that uh, is beneficial if you move that database to a global design? So let's quickly talk about Skill Builder. So come join the millions learning uh, with AWS training and certification, accelerating their impact. Uh, in a classroom, 
you can learn online or at your own pace. You can visit Skill Builder at our online center and explore over 600 free digital courses and hands-on labs and role-based games. So thank you for your time today, and I hope you learned something.